Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is McKenna Allen. I've been on my native plant journey for about eight years now. It all started when I witnessed a butterfly lay eggs on my plants. Witnessing that incredible event had me do a deep dive on all things pollinators, native plants, restoration, and conservation. The overwhelming amount of information available online is exactly that, overwhelming. I wanted to help educate the community and make their journey less intimidating and simplify information for them. So now I'm president and founder of the Wild Ones Greater Indianapolis chapter. I'm thrilled to have you with us for tonight's program, Combating the Biodiversity Crisis with Native Plants, featuring Sarah Gray and Coralie Palmer from the Indiana Native Plant Society. This webinar is being hosted on YouTube Live. We welcome the use of the chat feature, so feel free to introduce yourself. If you would like to hide the chat box, please enter full screen mode. Closed captioning is available and can be turned on in your settings, you can pause or rewind this webinar using the controls at the bottom of the player. Finally, links referenced in tonight's presentation can be found in the description below and will be posted in the chat by Wild One staff. For the, those of you who are new to Wild Ones, we are a membership organization devoted to promoting native landscapes through education, advocacy, and collaborative action. We carry out our mission through national education programs such as the Wild Ones Journal, Native Garden Designs, Seeds for Education grants, and webinars like this one. If you are not a Wild Ones member, we hope you join us in helping native plants and natural landscapes thrive in every community. At the local level, Wild Ones Chapters offers a knowledgeable, hands-on, and supportive community. Chapter programs include garden tours, speakers, conferences, as well as network with other nature enthusiasts and learn more about native plants. We're an inclusive community. Diverse voices and backgrounds make us stronger. That's why we welcome everyone to join us. Connect with your local Wild Ones chapter and begin making an environmental impact, contribute to education, and build a network focused on the preservation, restoration, and establishment of native plant communities. After speaking to so many other native plant enthusiasts, the consensus remains the same. People want to be part of the change, but don't know where to start. So I founded the Greater Indianapolis Wild Ones Seedling Chapter in May of 2023. As of January 3rd, 2024, we are now a chartered chapter. Our chapter's growth would not have been possible without the support and dedication of our board of directors and chapter members. I'm so thankful for all of you. I'm excited to see the impact the chapter has on the greater Indianapolis area. If there is not a chapter near you, please think about starting a Wild One Seedling chapter. Chapters form in a variety of ways. What they have in common is people like you who are passionate about the environment. Wild Ones provides support, guidance, and information. Start the conversation with Wild Ones and we can help grow a chapter in your area. Our chapter liaisons are in the chat if you have any questions or you can fill out your information on our website. And finally, programs like tonight's webinar would not be possible without generous support from all of you so please consider donating to Wild Ones today. Dwindling biodiversity is a threat to the foundation of life on Earth. In the last century alone, we've lost millions of acres of diverse ecosystems to urbanization. Native plants help protect and restore biodiversity, improve air and water quality, and provide wildlife with food and shelter. Wild Ones' vision is native plants and natural landscapes in every community, and your donation will help us reach that goal. Now, I'll turn it over to Kayla Estrada, who is our chapter's treasurer of the Wild Ones Greater Indianapolis. Thanks, McKenna. And now I have the pleasure of welcoming our speakers. Sarah Gray and Coralie Palmer have collaborated as part of the Indiana Native Plant Society's landscaping team on diverse landscaping projects across Indiana. 
Sarah Gray, with a background in environmental biology and entomology, is an advocate for native plant landscaping and active in the Na Indiana Native Plant Society. Coralie Palmer, a conservationist and landscape designer, is the founder of Sugar Bush Ecological Landscapes and the president of the Indiana Native Plant Society. Please join me in welcoming Sarah and Coralie as they discuss combating the biodiversity crisis with native plants. Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all. So just a really quick overview of what I'll be covering. I'll just briefly look at what biodiversity is and why it is so important. I'll outline some key concepts for supporting biodiversity in your landscape. And then Sarah will cover some of the principles for designing with native plants in more detail. I'll then give a brief overview of our design for Indianapolis and Sarah will dive into the details of the design. Then we'll just cover some of the resources available and hopefully have a little time for your questions at the end. So first up, why are native plants so important? And it really boils down to this key concept, biodiversity. So biodiversity is a variety of life in a given place. The native plant communities support a great deal more biodiversity than introduced plants, mainly due to specialized relationships that have evolved between plants and insects, with host specificity driven by phylogenetic history, plant defenses, and ecological experiences within specific environments. So the great majority of insect herbivores are diet or host plant specialists, meaning that they can really only eat or live on plants that they have developed a relationship with through evolution. So host range expansions are exceptions, which means that more species cannot use non-natives for growth and reproduction than can. And mandibular insects, which are the largest guild of insect herbivores, is both the most, most vulnerable to non-native plants and the most valuable to insectivores. Additionally, while some insects attempt to reproduce on non-native plants, these attempts can become ecological traps when the use of novel hosts results in mortality or reduced fitness. So studies have indicated that female insects might be induced to lay eggs on non-native plants that do not support successful larval development. So while introduced plants can provide some ecosystem functions, there's almost always a loss of biodiversity when they're used in place of native plants. And research from a very broad geographic range and across different species indicates a very clear trend. So biodiversity is in steep decline. The rate of global species extinction is tens to hundreds of times higher than the average over the last 10 million years. And very worryingly, this is accelerating. In terms of numbers, diversity, biomass, and importance to functioning ecosystems, insects eclipse all other animal forms of life on Earth. They're vital to life as we know it. They pollinate 90% of all flowering plants and are the primary means by which energy is transferred from plants to most other animals and food webs. They also play major roles in the critical processes of decomposition and nutrient cycling. However, insect abundance, biomass, species richness and range size are all declining. Meanwhile, here in the US, a 2019 ass assessment found staggering losses in the North American bird populations with an estimated net loss of 2.9 billion breeding adults since 1970. And devastating losses were found among birds in every biome. So, Biodiversity is in decline, but what does this mean and does it really matter? And the short answer is yes, it matters an awful lot. So the loss of biodiversity affects us all. A reduction in genetic diversity affects species potential for adaptation, ongoing evolution and survival. And this is becoming even more critical as fragile populations face increased pressure from climate change and loss in fragmentation of habitat through rapid development then the loss of individuals is in itself a tragedy and loss of abundance of individuals can lead to species extinctions. And then loss of each unique and intrinsically valuable species is irreparable and each species lost increases the risk of cascading effects with the loss of interdependent species and the breakdown and loss of entire ecosystems. And that is really, really important. 
So ecosystems are incredibly complex and we have limited understanding of even the most well-studied species interactions. And there are countless others that we have little to no knowledge of at all. We just don't know where the breaking points for ecosystems are. So when we lose biodiversity, we destabilize these systems and we risk their collapse. And then without functioning ecosystems, we lose the vital ecosystem services that support life. So some ecosystem services enhance our quality of life, but others are absolutely vital for human life, such as the provision of oxygen, food, and fresh water. So humans are completely dependent on the ecosystem services provided by plants and animals, and biodiversity is critical for ensuring the stability of the ecosystems that provide these services. So the conservation of biodiversity really is critical. And this is where what you do with your landscape really matters. So these are just some of the key concepts for supporting biodiversity in your landscape. So one of the really critical first steps is to identify and remove any invasive species. And then add native plants. And there are a few principles that can really help to increase the ecological value of your plantings. So be generous with your plantings. Ideally, planting should include more than 70% native plant biomass to support wildlife populations. And research indicates that this is a threshold level below which the probability of sustaining some local bird populations plummets to zero. And then species selection really can make a very big difference to the ecological value of your habitat. Recent research highlights that not all native plants are equivalent in terms of their contributions to energy flow through food webs. And some genera are critical for local ecosystems, really going above and beyond in terms of ecological productivity. For example, a 2020 study, which included over 12,000 butterfly and moth species and more than 2,000 native plant genera, found that on average, across counties sampled, 14% of local plant genera supported more than 90% of Lepidopteran diversity. So these keystone genera support orders of magnitude more butterfly and moth species than the majority of other local plant genera. And including these keystone native plants can have a disproportionately large impact. Additionally, data from a 2021 study suggests that bird foraging is non-random, reflecting preferences for keystone tree species, which host large numbers of caterpillar species, and so are more rewarding. This research highlights that planting, restoring, and protecting keystone species in both natural and human-dominated landscapes is important for both bird and insect populations. So those keystone species support high numbers of lepidoptera, or butterflies and moths, but the intention isn't to limit or restrict your plantings to just these. Ideally, you want to increase plant diversity overall with the intentional inclusion of those keystone species. And many native bees and other insects specialize on a particular plant family or genus when gathering pollen, and some specialize on a single species. So planting for specialists can greatly increase the biodiversity supported by the habitat, as both specialist and generalist species can be supported. So increasing diversity at the family level in particular increases the potential support for as many specialists as possible and may have a significant positive impact on populations that specialize on less commonly used plants. And then ensuring floral and other resources throughout the year is vitally important. So Sarah's gonna cover this um, important aspect in a bit more detail. But at home, if you're using software or tracing paper to sketch out a design, you can use different layers for the different times of year, just to try and ensure you're helping to provide resources for as long as possible. And then if you can, echo natural native plant communities and consider layer ha layered habitats. So adding a mix of trees, shrubs, herbaceous flowering plants, vines, grasses, sedges, and rushes can increase the number and diversity of species supported by your plantings, provide increased area and variety of habitat, increased vertical height and layers of cover. And then please, if possible, try and source plants that have not been treated for neonicotinoids or fungicides, and please avoid chemical use wherever possible. 
So herbivory by native insects will typically not kill a healthy plant. Evidence of herbivory indicates that a plant is, in fact, contributing to the ecosystem. And in a stable ecosystem with sufficient biodiversity, insect levels are kept largely in check by natural predators, including many of the birds that are such a welcome sight in our gardens. And please certainly try to source plants and seeds that have not been treated with neonics. Because they're absorbed into the plant, they can be present in pollen and nectar, making them toxic to pollinators that feed on them. And it's possible for these chemicals to harm pollinators, even when the applications are made months before the bloom period. And then please do try and leave plants intact over winter and leave leaves on the ground to provide food, overwintering habitat and nest sites. Reducing your lawn areas and increasing your native plant areas is a wonderful way to help support biodiversity. And then where you do need to mow, these are some steps that you can take to try and reduce the impacts. So hopefully, if you're able to adopt some of these concepts, you'll have some great results. Um, this is just some of the biodiversity found in my suburban central Indiana garden. So now I'll pass over to Sarah, who's going to explore how you can apply these principles when you're designing with native plants. Thank you, Coralie. Before you embark on your native planting project, you need to assess your site. Consider how your site relates to its surroundings, whether it is in an urban setting, the countryside, near woods, water, or perhaps in a residential area. What existing features and habitats exist already on the site? What features do you want to keep, like perhaps paths or other physical features that can be enhanced by planting? This is uh, a picture of our house when we first moved in. Um, my daughter described it as a house of the Chainsaw Massacre, so, but it was easily transformed by a change in paint colour and some native planting. Also look at your yard and determine what function you want each area to perform. You may want to preserve or enhance a nice view or keep some lawn area for the children to play on, but perhaps turn the rest into a wildflower meadow. Creating seating areas and entertaining areas to relax and view your beautiful gardens are important. I have a morning coffee bench, an afternoon tea arbor and a gin and tonic seat in different parts of the garden. Landscapes with many vegetation layers like this one on the right are important to many birds and other creatures because they provide many things to eat as in compared to the landscape above it. Many birds are layer specialists or use several layers depending on the seasonal purpose. For example, bluebirds nest in one layer in holes of trees or on the edge of a meadow but hunt almost exclusively on the ground for insects and spiders. Chickadees, on the other hand, nest in canopy tree holes, but survive the winter by foraging for seeds in meadows. Hermit thrushes forage for arthropods and worms and leaf litter in spring and summer until the ground freezes and then they rely on berries during the winter. And species like the scarlet tanager, wood thrush and most warblers are interior forest species and prefer mature forests with a closed canopy. So include the different vegetation layers for maximum biodiversity. Another big consideration is 
flowering phenology and ensuring that you are planting so that landscapes have a successional blooming period and floral resources for as long a season as possible from early spring through late fall. Native trees and shrubs are most important for pollinators, particularly insects, and different trees produce pollen at different times of the season. So it's good to include wind and insect pollinator plants, which will extend the season of benefit to wildlife. They are a major part of the caterpillar snack bar and provide nesting and sheltering sites, as well as being lower maintenance. There are lots of plants to choose from that bloom in late spring and summer, but extend that flowering into fall with plants such as goldenrods and asters, which are an important food source for those creatures preparing for migration or over overwintering. The variety of plants you can have in a smaller yard is going to be a bit more limited, so choose plants carefully. Selecting those that have more than one season of interest, it's not only good for wildlife, but it provides more visual interest in your garden. So for example, choose plants with not only flowers, but also berries, colorful bark, and perhaps nice fall color like the Padoga dogwood. Including some native evergreens in your yard is important as they provide shelter and food in the form of berries and cones for wildlife, particularly birds during the winter. There are many varieties to choose from, uh, native junipers, pines and American arbor vitae uh, prefer full sun, whereas hemlocks and yews will grow in partial shade. From a design point of view, evergreens can help to give structure to a garden these, with other deciduous trees and shrubs, are the backbone of a the garden. They form a framework and help anchor other plants within the space. Evergreen hedges can be used to define internal boundaries of a garden and are useful to frame or block views or lead your eye around the design. They also provide colour and interest in the winter garden. When selecting trees and shrubs for your site, take into account the ultimate size of the plant so it is not planted too close to structures such as power lines, houses and other plants. Plant labels are not always accurate and may only give you the size it gets after five or ten years. But remember, plants keep growing and that small conifer you planted right next to your house could end up blocking your view quicker than you think. So there is actually a house behind this huge hedge here. Large trees are valuable providing shade and cooling your house and yard, but are expensive to remove, especially if they have fallen on your house. So choose wisely. You may want to plant the ultimate keystone species, an oak, but remember it can get to 60 to 80 feet tall. So unless you have a couple of acres, choose a more appropriate size tree for a smaller yard, like this surface berry, or perhaps a red bud or a dogwood. Assess how much sun and shade you have and at what time of day. Some plants prefer morning sun and will wilt or scorch in the hot afternoon sun, so they should be planted facing east. Plants that require more than six hours of sun a day should be planted in a south or a southwest facing site. Take note of the difference of the angle of the sun in winter and summer and shading from taller plants and buildings. By knowing these things, you can choose the right plants with light requirements for, for specific areas. Most of the prairie plants like full sun, like the yellow coneflower, royal catchfly and anise hyssop. Those that prefer part sun or part shade are very useful plants for edge of woodlands or east facing gardens. Two of my favorites are hoary skullcap, Scutellaria incana, which is not fussy about soil type and will seed itself moderately, as well as Indian pink, Spigella marilandica, which is a showy plant for part shade and is loved by hummingbirds. There are fewer flowering plants for shade where ferns and sedges thrive, but white baneberry, Actea pachypoda, has white flowers which produce these unusual berries called doll's eyes. 
If you want to see which species like which conditions, look at native species as they occur naturally in the wild in places like parks and conservation areas. Another consideration is what type of soil do you have? Is it a sand, silt or clay? How much organic matter it has will determine the amount of water, air and nutrients it holds and how well plants will grow. You may find the soil type will vary in different parts of your yard. If you live on a former cornfield, like a lot of the new subdivisions popping up around Indianapolis, you may have poor clay soil compacted with very little topsoil, in which case it's probably wet and heavy in winter and like concrete in summer. So you may need to bring in additional soil and add organic matter like composted leaves and bark. The good news is there are native plants that live quite happily in clay and as they grow, their roots release sugars and other compounds that feed microorganisms, microorganisms in the soil, such as bacteria and fungi, which form symbiotic relationships with the roots and aid in the cycling of essential nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus and help with sub disease suppression and soil health. A rich diversity of invertebrates such as earthworms, beetles and ants rely on native plants for food, shelter and reproduction. And these invertebrates in turn contribute to soil aeration and other important ecosystem functions. So by planting native plants, you increase biodiversity, not only above ground, but below ground as well. If you have an area that often has standing water, you may consider putting in a rain garden. But before choosing the plants for your soil type, know a plant's water requirements to ensure you choose the right plants for the right place. Knowing your soil's pH can also guide you in selecting the appropriate plants. In this part of Indiana, our soil tends to be clay with a neutral to slightly alkaline pH between 7 and 8. So it's harder to grow plants that prefer, prefer a more acidic pH of 6 like rhododendrons, azaleas and hollies. You can test your soil's pH with a pH test kit or send a sample to your county extension. An important thing to consider when designing any landscape is how much time you're willing to spend in maintenance. Your level of expertise may influence how complicated the design is and what plants you choose. If you have a company maintain the landscaping, what level of expertise do they have, if any? If you are a novice gardener, I would limit the plant palette to fewer species, planting in large blocks or sways, and label the plants if possible, as you'll probably forget them when they're coming up the next year. Start with a border, which you can easily manage. If you want a lower maintenance landscape, then go for trees and shrubs, perhaps grasses and ground covers. I also ask clients, what is their budget? Because once you're buying in a buying mood, costs can quickly mount up, especially if you're paying for a consultant. The good thing is native plants are very reasonably priced because they're often sold in small sizes. Even native trees are often sold as bare rootstock or in one, three or five gallon sizes, which is not only cheaper, but being smaller, they can put more energy in establishing good roots rather than having to sustain a larger canopy for the first few years, which means they grow faster quickly, catching up to a larger tree that you would probably need the nursery to deliver, dig the hold and plant. So where are there opportunities in our yards to increase biodiversity? The obvious choice is to shrink your lawn and plant a prairie. But this is not always practical. You may want to keep part of your lawn. Your site may be too small, not get enough sun or your HOA may have restrictions. If you have turf grass, you can at least reduce or eliminate the use of fertilizers and herbicides on your lawn and select grass mixes containing fine fescues and tall fescues rather than conventional rye grass, which reduce the amount of water, fertilizer and mowing needed. Perhaps create a bee lawn by seedling, seeding a mixture of 
low growing perennials that bloom at different times of the year, such as clovers, violets, wild strawberries or self heal. This uh, spring beauty lawn provides an important food source for spring pollinators. Leaving bare areas of soil helps ground nesting bees like these nest holes under the eaves of my house where the soil is dry and friable. They only lay one or two eggs, so they're not a problem and they are important pollinators. There may be areas in your yard where you could add a pocket prairie or pollinator border, such, such as at the entrance to your property, which will give it year-long curb appeal, or perhaps between your neighbours, as I have done here. This not only defines the boundary between properties, but may hopefully encourage a curiosity amongst your neighbours for native plants, particularly when they see all the beautiful butterflies it attracts and they may be inspired to do the same. So now we're going to look at a few scenarios where planting natives can help solve a landscaping problem. A situation where native plants are the best choice are on steep slopes like this one. This is a, this is a um, client's garden, which where there's a very steep slope, um, it was, initially covered in landscaping fabric, planted with day lilies, which the deer love, and a few non-native grasses and a few shrubs. Then it was heavily mulched every year, a lot of which slid off the fabric and ended up at the bottom when we had heavy rain. The last couple of years, I have been removing the fabric and planting plants with deep roots to hold the soil such as indigo plant, cut plants, which can have roots as long as 15 feet, joe pieweed, mountain mint, and gray-headed coneflowers. It's not only buzzing with pollinators, but the slope is stabilized and there is no longer need for tons of mulch. So again, saving my clients quite a bit of money. If you are on a lake, like we are, Wave action from boats and from storms and ice erode the banks, so planting natives along the edge helps to anchor the soil in place. It also prevents erosion and the loss of valuable topsoil, especially when we get flooding events. It also deters geese. You may have an area or lawn which is too steep to mow, so a border of native plants solves this problem. This is what um, a lot of retention ponds look like in Indiana. This one is just down the road from me and it has problems with algal blooms from fertilizer runoff and of course geese, which like the short grass. In contrast, this one at Village Walk in Zionsville, um, their HOA decided to put in a native tall grass prairie, including shrubs, trees, grasses, and wildflowers along the pond edge. The dense roots of the native plants help to stabilize the soil and act as natural filters, capturing and absorbing pollutants and excess nutrients that would otherwise enter the water. The varying heights of vegetation help stagger rainfall prevent sediment, leaves and trash from making their way into the pond. This resulted in reducing soil erosion, improving the water quality so they no longer needed chemicals to kill the algal bloom. There was also an increase in dissolved oxygen in the water, which was good for fish and for fishing, and it attracted an array of desirable wildlife and deterred undesirable ones like the geese. And you have to agree, it looks a lot nicer. This is our vegetable garden. And it is surrounded by native plants, including some common milkweed, which has self-seeded amongst the vegetables. Not only do they attract bees, which will pollinate our vegetables, but they also attract beneficial insects and birds that keep pests, caterpillars in check. Consequently, we do not have to need we do not need to use any insecticides. So whether you ditch your lawn for a prairie 
or you just make a pollinator bed or two, here are a few design principles and tips which will help to ensure your native planting scheme does not frighten your overneat neighbours. Define borders with neat edges. Have mown areas to create paths and a boundary around your prairie so it looks intentional and not like you've just left a whole lot of weeds to grow. Features such as entranceways and seating give the garden a sense of purpose. And signage can be useful to convey your purpose. A bit of artwork can add a sense of fun and interest. If you leave part of a dead tree standing, the wildlife will appreciate it. And it's a perfect place for this 40 pound concrete head I carried back on the plane from England. Unfortunately, these metal wasps were a bit too big to bring back. Plant flowers in large blocks or drifts in groups of three or five of the same plant rather than in a single plant. This will create a larger impact and give structure to your garden. Another tip is to repeat patterns of plants with similar, similar colours as you can see here in my garden. Once insects find a flower type they like, bees and other pollinators like to harvest from multiple blooms and it makes it easier to find the flowers. At the moment, there is a ring of black-eyed Susans and also taller Rudabecchia subtomentosa. The yellow is mixed with blue mist flower, which will happily spread throughout the garden. You may notice there is no mulch in sight. Um, if you plant densely enough, after a couple of years, the plants have merged and there is no room or need for mulch. I only mulch new borders for the first couple of years to suppress weeds and conserve water, and I use large wood chips free from arborists, which allow water and nutrients through the soil. Heavy mulching with fine bark forms tends to form a solid mat. So this not only stops weeds from growing, but also the plants that you want to spread from spreading. It's also more difficult for water and nutrients to penetrate. I find using a colour wheel to be helpful to develop plant colour palettes. Using different plant colour combinations can make your garden look more interesting and add that wow factor. For example, opposite colours on the colour wheel feel complete, um, will complement each other, like yellow and purple, as seen in this ironweed and perennial sunflowers, or purple and pink as in the asters and black-eyed Susans. This high contrast creates a vibrant look, but should be used sparingly. Adjoining colors on the color wheel create warming or cooling effects. These are colors which are close to each other on the color wheel. These harmonious colors are pleasing to the eye and create a sense of order. Choose one color to dominate and other colors to support it. So cool colours tend to recede, warm ones make things appear to be closer. So if you have a long garden and you want it to appear shorter, plant warm colours against a recess of colour like green as it shortens the view. Make, uh, make sure, make short gardens appear larger by planting cool colours using blues and greens. You can also paint structures like arbors to enhance that visual impact. Gray and blue foliage brightens more somber violets and purples and work well with pastel colors. Two of my favorite gray pollinator plants are hoary mountain mint and giant hyssop, which are both covered in many species of bees and wasps in the summer. They can be a bit aggressive in nature, uh, um, be a bit aggressive, um, so it's better to plant them with other um, fairly aggressive plants like bee balm and grey-headed coneflowers, and they can duke it out amongst themselves. So I wouldn't perhaps plant them in a small border. They need plenty of room. Clusters of blue, purple, orange and yellow flowers draw the most bees. If you want to attract hummingbirds, include some red flowers. 
A mix of colours creates a wild feel to the garden, whereas a single colour theme borders look more sophisticated and cohesive. And if you get it wrong and you find your colours clash, remember the wildlife don't care. They see colours differently from us anyway. And you can always dig plants up, especially perennials, and move them about a bit. They're pretty forgiving. A good way of discovering different plant combinations is to visit botanical gardens and other people's native gardens. Don't forget contrasting shapes and textures. They create visual excitement. So, for example, Rattlesnake Master is a good example of an architectural plant which can be used to create a focal point. Grasses en masse add movement and an airy texture to a planting. Perhaps contrast fine textured leaves like this blue star with, for example, larger, more solid forms like the, the lamb's ear. Landscaping with plants is a bit like painting a picture, but because plants are living and growing and changing with the seasons, so too will your picture. Those trees and shrubs you planted will eventually produce shade, changing your hot sunny border into one of part shade, and your sun-loving plants may no longer thrive. Or some of your plants may like where they are a bit too much, overcrowding some of the more delicate species. So be prepared to do some editing at some stage perhaps removing aggressive species in some areas or changing species to accommodate new conditions. So now you have seen why biodiversity is important, what you need to consider when choosing your native plants, the importance of the right plant in the right place, and have some ideas on where you can incorporate native planting, plantings, as well as how to make your landscape look appealing. So now we are going to show you how all of this can be translated into doing an actual design for a typical yard in Indiana. So I'm going to hand you over to Coralie for this next part. Thank you so much, Sarah. So I'm just going to give a very broad overview of some of the key features of the garden, and then Sarah's going to dig into the details of the species chosen for the design. So we envisioned this site as being typical of many subdivisions here in Indiana, built on a partially cleared wooded lot in cornfields. So the soil is a mixture of heavy, poorly drained clay to the north of the property and loamy soil to the south and surrounding the house. It's anticipated that with the increase in temperatures due to climate change, the winter and spring months will be wetter here with an increased likelihood of flooding and that summer and fall may, may be hotter and drier. So we've selected plants that are both appropriate to the conditions on the site and may be resilient to future, climate, future challenges caused by climate change, but all of the species used in the design are native to Indiana. So the design is intended to be both ecologically valuable and a plant lover's garden with a high abundance of plants and a high diversity at species, genus and family levels, providing both habitat and enjoyment through the year for both human and other than human visitors. So we imagine this is a family home, um, a bit of an oasis and somewhere that can be really enjoyed. A key feature is the lovely pond area, providing some really valuable habitat. And we'll talk about that in some more detail in a minute. We have a number of seating areas. In the Northeast, we have a small deck and arbor by the pond and another arbor covered deck by the back door, offering light shade in the heat of summer and the opportunity for some native climbing plants. The permeable brick paved area off the deck by the house offers a further seating area. Um, you could add a small fire pit here, and this area has a built-in grill. Raised beds on either side of a trellis here for growing vegetables. And then rain barrels by the vegetable raised beds and on the southeast corner of the front of the house, capture and store water to be used to water plants. On the northeast corner, a stone riverbed directs excess water away from the house to the rain garden and pond. So both the driveway and the front path are permeable, either with permeable pavers or gravel. The sunny west side path has stepping stones on a gravel walkway, and the east side path has stepping stones on a mulch pathway. 
There's a hidden area for composting leaves and other organic matter to use as a soil conditioner and for mulch around plants for moisture retention and weed suppression. And then in the sedge lawn at the front of the property, a bird bath acts as a focal point, providing water for wildlife and providing opportunities for wildlife watching from the windows and from the shaded seating area. So once we designed the layout of the main areas and the hardscaping, we focused in on the larger structural trees and shrubs that really form the bones of the design. So up in the northeast corner, we've placed a large structural water-loving species where it has space to thrive, it provides shade for the little deck, and it should love the wetter, heavier soil. We've got understory trees and shrubs beneath this, providing those important layers of habitat and a bit of a screen and creating a slightly more hidden seating area. On the northwest and southwest corners, faster growing small flowering trees provide early structure and a newer build, bringing welcome spring color and important early season resources. And then up in the northwest corner, there's again a layered understory and an evergreen to provide a screen for the compost area and winter cover for wildlife. And the southeast corner, another shaded glade and sitting seating area. And then the lawn areas that might in a more traditional garden be turf grass are instead densely planted with sedges to reduce mowing requirements and associated energy use and to provide increased habitat. So depending on the look required, the planting could be dominated by one sedge species. Um, so for example, Carex jamesii can be ideal for this, or it could be a matrix of several sedge species with spring ephemerals and low growing perennial forbs since planted to provide interest in floral resources. So the pond is a major feature of this garden and is a haven for wildlife, particularly in hot dry spells. So this part of the site remains waterlogged longer after heavy periods of rain. So installing a pond is a solution to controlling excess water from the garden and runoff from the house. So it, the runoff drains from a downspout into the dry riverbed leading to, leading to the rain garden and pond. The east side of the pond is constructed to be shallower for water plants and to provide habitat for aquatic and semi-aquatic life, and hopefully will help support the local amphibian populations. The soil removed from the pond is used to build up a gently sloping back on the west side of the pond, creating a border edged in shrubs. Then large boulders are placed around the pond at intervals, providing extra spaces to sit and add interest. So along the sides of the house, a gravel path with staggered stepping stones meanders down the west side, providing a place for sun-loving grasses, herbs, and forbs that will thrive in dry conditions. Along the east side of the house, the mulch path with stepping stones provides an area for shade-loving species dominated by ferns and sedges. And then the front entrance borders are more formal than the rest of the design with large drifts of fewer species, a bit more of an emphasis on showier blooms and more of a deliberate, deliberate placement. So species chosen are predominantly medium and short plants and grasses that would be allowed within most subdivision HOA ordinances. And now Sarah is going to uh, dig a bit deeper into the species we've chosen. So nearly all the native plants chosen for our design are growing in my garden or Coralies, so we know what conditions they like and where they will grow. She said the largest tree on the property is a river birch. Planted in the corner of the wettest part of the garden where it will have where it will give some light shade over the raised deck area. The other trees are small to medium and include a couple of red buds here and here and a florida dogwood here and a couple of service berries which, which will not get too large and create problems when they are mature. There is also a, a pyramidal shaped arbor vitae which is here which will provide shelter and berries for overwintering birds as well as hide the compost area from the house. Moisture loving shrubs planted on the north side, which can cope with a heavier clay soil, include 
winterberry, buttonbush, red twig dogwood, spicebush, and bladder nut. They provide winter interests with their colorful stems, berries, and or attractive seed pods, as well as being of high wildlife value. Smooth hydrangea is a useful shrub for a shady area, as is the shorter northern bush honeysuckle, Diavilla linicera, which makes a good ground cover under trees and is very adaptable to most soil and light conditions. On the front side of the house, a bio hedge, including uh, nine bark, black core, viburnum, and eastern wahoo, provide privacy from the neighbor's property and the street, as well as nesting sites and food for birds and other wild, wildlife. The front yard has a southern and westerly exposure and experiences hotter and drier conditions, particularly adjacent to the house drive and paths. Here the soil is a faster draining loam, so drought tolerant native plants were chosen, which thrive in these conditions. This includes the strip between the road and the sidewalk, which decreases the need for watering and maintenance, as well as provides a more attractive buffer between the street and property. We um, envisage this area to look like Karen Anderson's garden up here from Native Plants Unlimited, which she planted in native annuals on the first year and until the short prairie species like butterfly weed, blazing star and prairie drop seed became established. Tall, per, taller perennials, including the bush-like wild indigo and common blue star, form an inform, informal low hedge on the west side of the property. The design of the backyard pond area is based off a similar situation in my garden. We had an area sloping away from the house, which would stay wet after heavy rain and which suffered from erosion. So we put in a pond with a rain garden, uh, with a rain garden area below it, both of which take excess rain water from the garden and the house. The gravel path next to the pond is similar to the dry riverbed in the design, which with the plants slow down the flow when we have a heavy downpour. Erosion is no longer a problem and we have many birds, invertebrates and amphibians that visit the pond or live in it, including a resident water snake. It is a lovely feature in the garden, providing a calming, relaxing atmosphere. A variety of moisture-loving forbs provide colour, food and cover for insects and birds in the rain garden and surrounding pond area. The American wisteria climbing over the arbor is beautiful in June, followed by the purple and yellow passion flower later in the summer. They provide shade for the uh, sitting area and, are, and all three are fragrant and visited by butterflies, birds and bees. In both the northwest and southeast corners of the property, Areas under the trees are planted as small shady woodland glades with a combination of sedges, ferns and a variety of spring ephemerals and several species of shade loving aster and goldenrod species to provide a long season of resources for wildlife. The plantings will help to decrease weed competition and aid in water absorption. Spring ephemerals are particularly important as they provide nectar and pollen to insects as they emerge in early spring before the trees and shrubs and other flowers um, emerge. The woolly Dutchman's pipe is a shade loving climber for the pergola on the north side and is the host for the pipe vine swallowtail. So now you're probably wondering where can we, you find all these fantastic plants? Coralie is going to briefly mention some of the amazing resources you can find on the Indiana Native Plant website.
So thank you so much, Sarah. Um, so yes, as Sarah mentioned, the INPS website um, is absolutely full of fantastic information. Um, we also have a, an excellent Instagram account and a very active Facebook group where you can find many of our expert members happy to help with plant ID and advice. We have um, this wonderful native plant finder tool on our website um, where you can filter pl plants for light, color, moisture, bloom time, and pollinators. We have a by natives directory where you can find native plant growers, sellers, and designers in Indiana. We also have a native seed communities program to expand access to seed grown Indiana natives. And you can certify your native garden while supporting local environmental groups. So thank you so much. Um, we have a few events the rest of this year. We have a plant sale on August 31st at Holiday Park in Indianapolis and our annual conference is on the weekend of the October 26th. Um, the conference itself is on the Saturday, while the Friday has an amazing full schedule of native plant related activities in and around Indianapolis. So please feel so welcome to join us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah and Coralie. Now let's answer a few of the many great questions we received from registrants. The first question, Brian asks, I've been planting native trees and plants for the past two years, but haven't seen many pollinators on my native plants. Is this because my neighbors aren't also planting natives or is it a sign of the insect apocalypse? I'm very concerned for the insects, birds, and other wildlife. Um, uh, this is this is quite a difficult one to answer. Um, you know, hopefully it's not a sign of the insect apocalypse. But um, well, I don't know what sort of neighbourhood this person lives in. Um, it could be that their neighbours perhaps are using um, pesticides in their garden, which will affect the number of uh, insects in the area. Um, could be if she is in a new neighborhood, there may not be um, many existing native plants present or even ecosystems like woods nearby. Um, so there may not be many insects in the areas in the in the area in the first place. Um, also, um, uh, some insects they fly relatively short distances. So bees fly up to five to six miles. Um, and some ins insects don't fly at all, so they've got to find her property and say if she's in a newer subdivision, there's not many trees or shrubs or other plants around, it's a bit like a food desert or looking for a, a needle in a haystack for the insects. So it might take a, a, a few years, a couple of years for them to um, find the lovely native plants on her property. And then those insects, they will need to take time and need to breed um, for new insects to emerge. Um, I think that's all I can think about for this question. Our next question is from Patricia. I have a mix of non-native, native and native ours. I don't really understand why cultivars slash native ours are bad. If cloned from native plants, how are they harmful? So thank you, yes. Um, so it's a good question and there it's definitely an area where there is active research and more research is needed. Um, but from an ecological standpoint, straight native species really are um, safer than native ours or cultivars. Um, and really, so native ours can alter both um, pollination and foraging behavior, and they can also potentially impact native plant populations themselves through genetic interactions. Um, so many native ours have been selected prim primarily for ornamental traits, um, and research has shown that they're not always ecologically equivalent um, substitutions for native species. Where research has been done showing that they're used by pollinators, it doesn't. It is sometimes based um, on numbers of pollinators rather than diversity of species of pollinators. So again, we might still be missing those um, that diversity of pollinators and some of those specialists that really rely heavily on 
on uh, a certain um, species or genus. Um, we also don't really know many of the cues that foragers, that pollinators or foragers use. Um, we're still learning all the time, but we are only just beginning to scratch the surface of other species senses. And um, so when we think we're changing, um, you know, just the color or just this, we don't actually know what impact that's having um, on the species that rely on those plants. So for that, for that reason, and I, I, um, I tend, I avoid them, I don't use native arts. Also at the genetic level, um, so there can be unintended hybridization um, between native arts and, and wilder or other um, natural native population, natural populations of native species. Um, and this can lead to gene flow into those wild populations. So this can affect native population survival and contribute to potentially contribute to species extinction. So it's something that that especially if you're close to a, um, a natural area certainly um, is worth avoiding. Um, and where native eyes have been selected for kind of vigor, hybridization is concerning and can affect the competitive interactions and community structure in those wild populations. And then finally, so native eyes are often produced, uh, propagated clonally. And so they don't have the genetic variation um, that you would find in, a, in an open source or seed source population. Um, and genetic diversity found within native plant populations is, um, is critical and it's going to become more so as um, they need to adapt to climate change um, and increase development. So open pollinated or seed grown selections of natives are preferable to native ours produced vegetatively, but information on native our provenance is not always easily available. Um, so unless you're really able to do your research and you're very sure of how that's um, been brought about, again, it's safer to go with a straight native species. And there are, um, there are nuances, um, you know, for example, if it's, if they've been selected for disease resistance, or if there's a particular case, so it is a, it is a nuanced situation, but um, on the whole, it's safest to, to stay with a straight native species. Ruth asks about some maintenance tips for a yard that features different native planting zones, such as prairie and woodland edge areas, specifically how to manage the transitions or edges between these native plant zones in the lawn. Um, okay, thank you. Yes, it's a, it's a good question. Um, and so this is a similar situation to I have. I have a, a woodland um, and woods edge garden. Um, and really, I do very minimal maintenance. I have um, a lot, um, hundreds of native plants in, and a lot of them are quite mature now. And um, the maintenance is really very, um, very little. I um, I leave, in pl I leave plants intact over winter. I leave the leaves on the ground. Um, I leave um, stems up kind of through the whole of the year. Um, I don't, you know, I, in the following spring, I don't take them down. I leave them up. They tend to break down. And so um, they'll only be, you know, a foot or so high, but I leave those through as nesting um, sites. Um, for lawn edges, I have um, I've got pieces of old vine and fallen logs from our woodland, and I've created edges and kind of borders. Or my dad actually has I didn't do it um, around so that you've got those defined planting areas, um, and then we do have a small lawn area that's um, that we're we're converting to to sedges and um, lower growing perennials, but within those defined borders, um, and it's all all made from found materials from the woods. Um, we we tend to to not do a lot of maintenance at all. Our last question is from Gail. Deer pressure in suburban and even urban areas can be severe on native plants, especially young perennials, trees, and shrubs. By striving for plant diversity, how could or should this be managed? 
Um, well, I have a lot of deer on my property as well, and it is difficult to keep them in check. Uh, sprays uh, work for a short term, but you have to repeat them often, and especially when we have a lot of rain, that's not always very effective. So I find the most effective ways to use barriers. Um, you could try fencing the whole area if possible, um, but that's not always very practical. So otherwise, perhaps um, just fence off individual plants, especially if they're trees and shrubs. Uh, even if the deer don't eat them, um, there's also a problem the males will rub them with their antlers or rub the, the bark off or may even destroy the tree completely, which they've done several times in my garden. Um, so you could just use some um, heavy, duty, heavy duty gauged wire, uh, make a fence around the shrub or the tree. Um, try and plant plants that they don't particularly like. Um, they, I know from experience they do like hydrangeas and garden flocks. So choose ones that they don't like, um, particularly those with a strong scent. So something like uh, mints, uh, something from the mint family, bee balms or hyssops. They have a very strong scent and deer tend to avoid them. Um, I found a good way, uh, a good thing to do is to hide the more palatable plants amongst them. They may still um, sample them, especially if they're young, if the, the fawns, they don't really know what they like to eat, so they'll try and eat anything. <laughs> but um, just persevere, <laughs> keep planting. Thank you so much, Sarah and Coralie. Finally, keep an eye on our website for updates about upcoming webinars. Thank you so much again for joining us. We hope you enjoyed combating the biodiversity crisis with native plants. We extend our gratitude to our speakers and we wish you all the best.